Hello, and welcome to this COVID-19 Global Virtual Summit. I'm Dave Fuhrer, the CEO of Grit Health. I'm also a two-time cancer survivor and an oncology researcher. We have a remarkable lineup of some of the world's leading experts who have spent their careers in the prevention, testing, treatment, and innovation to solve our most pressing challenges in healthcare. I am equally as honored to welcome the global cancer community and everybody who's dealing with this remarkably challenging situation now with COVID. We are bringing everyone together for open conversation, questions, and interactions. We encourage you to ask questions, use the chat bar, stay interactive throughout this whole session, and to also please invite anybody else who you think this might be meaningful for. All of this will be live for the next four and a half hours and then available 24 seven going forward. So you can go back, see anything you missed or uh, learn more from things you wanna follow up with. I was reflecting this morning about why we named our company Grit. I wanted to share with you a blog that our chairwoman, Shelly Nolden, wrote while she was going through three years of treatment for APL. Shelly writes in 2011, because of the ongoing nature of treatment, cancer patients have true grit forced upon us. Although we don't have a choice, there are so many I admire for how they respond. All of the members of my cancer club support each other because we understand the need to maintain our true grit day after day. So do our families who serve as the pillars of our strength every day with us. Instead of wondering why this string of mishaps has happened to the people I care about, my brother's positive attitude has made me focus on the resiliency of the human spirit. It is amazing how strong we can be. Thank you, Matt, for reminding me that although it begins with the mind, there is nothing fictional about having grit. I leave you with those words because they are the core, the values that drive our team every day in the work that we do. It has been an honor to create this event to welcome the global cancer community, all of the people who are working so hard to get us through this crisis, and you. We look forward to your feedback. I would like to also encourage you to stay connected 24 seven by using the Grit Health Cancer Platform anytime, anywhere in the world you are. You can download it for free from Google Play or the App Store, or visit our website at grithealth.com spelled grit with a Y. We also have a special coronavirus page where the resources from all of these sessions are available for quick access and to connect with the speakers who are here with us. I encourage you to follow us on social media. And one last item, if you're interested in having your voice, your experience, be a part of the future of cancer treatment, I encourage you to register for the GRIT project on our GRIT Health page. This is a place where you can learn about patient experience research and have your voice and what you go through be a part of the future of treatments. And also, next Saturday, April 25th, we're having our Cancer and Your Mental Health event. It is a full day focused on the unique challenges that we as cancer survivors face led by some of the experts who focus on taking care of our mental health. We have a kickoff session at 10 a.m. Eastern next Saturday, led by the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, and then a full day of experts, advocates, and some of the most general people I can think of to help us focus on our mental health. In just a moment, I'll introduce our partner from the American Association for Precision Medicine. Dr. Prasoon Mishra and his team are some of the most remarkable scientists, researchers, health providers, and experts I've ever had the pleasure of meeting. It is an honor to spend this time together with people who have spent their careers working to solve problems just like the one we're facing today. 
please stay engaged, make comments. You are a part of the community and we are honored to get through this together. And with that, I'm pleased and grateful to introduce Dr. Mishra. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you, Dave, for that kind introduction. And good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, everyone, from, what, uh, from whatever part of the world you are joining. Welcome to uh, CGS 2020 COVID-19 Global Summit, uh, which is brought to you by American Association for Precision Medicine and, and Grit Health. Uh, and the teams have worked uh, literally day and night to bring this to you. So American Association for Precision Medicine's goal is to accelerate the field of precision medicine through research, education, communication, and collaboration to foster new medical breakthroughs. And we are at aapm.health. And our, also, our goal is also to bring uh, of four piece of precision medicine, that's patient, uh, uh, providers, public health planners, government, and payers to work together to achieve the goal of delivering uh, improved outcomes. And, uh, AAPM Coronavirus Task Force was uh, is an, a, a, abbreviated as ACT, uh, as AAPM's initiative, and it was uh, the first task force in the United States of America formed against coronavirus. And uh, in, uh, in, in January, January, when I was recruiting um, uh, folks to this task force, uh, I, uh, uh, I spoke to skeptics who told me that this is a China problem, it's not a US problem. And I'm trained um, uh, during the HIV pandemic, and I I know that these uh, porous borders and uh, and uh, man-made boundaries will not be able to contain this uh, virus. So we have a, a global team uh, uh, working together on different aspects, and you will hear uh, uh, updates uh, later in the conference. Uh, these are acts uh, eminent uh, clinical uh, clinician leaders, executive team, and chairs. They are leaders in their field, uh, coming together um, uh, to uh, uh, to contribute and conquer this uh, this uh, you know uh, pandemic. And act is utilizing uh, the a unique ecosystem that AAPM has built uh, with technology partners, investors, member, company, member companies, academic institutions, uh, government and hospital and healthcare solutions uh, to organize training program, mentor, uh, you know, advice, you know, and, and, and provide advices to accelerate, ex accelerate uh, 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 the field of precision medicine uh, so in, in overall, uh, we, we provide mentoring, expertise, ecosystem, and data connect. And AAPM with our partners have over a, a reach of over 1 million patient, patients and uh, approximately 25,000 professionals and over 500 startups, and the list is growing. And AAPM Grid Health Initiative is to use our knowledge base to help uh, patients um, and the community to uh, get the right information and to fight misinformation. So, uh, so, uh, so, so, what makes the novel coronavirus uh, so infectious? So there are uh, there are um, uh, now we know that uh, SARS-CoV-2 uh, uh, has uh, you know uh, not only has a furin binding site on the on the ACE2 receptor. Uh, ACE2 receptor, the, the um, sorry, the spike proteins on the, uh, uh, so it has a, a furin binding sites on the spike proteins and also binds to ACE2 receptor, which is on human cells 10 to 20 times um, uh, tighter. And now we also know that this binding induces a, fu a, a, a fusion mechanism. So the, the walls fuse and, and the, the virus basically is endocytos and where the RNA is released, uh, amplified, and the virus actually hijacks Golgi complex, Golgi complex to make uh, its proteins and then virus is uh, uh, exocytos out. Uh, that's how the virus particles are created. And is the virus mutating? Yes, there, there are four different unique uh, 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 strains are reported. You can see that in, in, uh, they're also color coded and it, there is a data suggesting that the purple uh, strain that was in, in uh, China was uh, um, uh, a little less aggressive than the ones that is in US, which is uh, uh, red. Um, uh, uh, so, uh, what happens? Why this virus is killing people? So uh, you can. So there. So there are three. three sorry, there are three stages of the uh, 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 disease. One is the asymptomatic. Uh, the second is. Uh, 
upper respiratory tract infection. The third is uh, flu-like symptoms. Um, and the majority of hosp hospital visits are uh, in during the third stage. And the fourth stage is severe illness and, um, and pneumonia. And this may lead to ARDS, acute respiratory distress syndrome. And you can see that uh, the image shows you how, how the, uh, the virus has uh, affected uh, the lungs. And I would like you to show this video and see the progression of the disease. So if you see the yellow markings inside, that is the, uh, so this is a, a image released by the GW hospital and the yellow markings are, um, so this is the COVID-19 patient. And uh, so the disease progresses. So initially what happens is that the linings of this, uh, uh, you know, branches of the uh, lung, uh, uh, so lung respiratory branches, they get uh, um, uh, the cells die and that's when the immune system is deployed. And then if immune systems can uh, control them, then the disease will not progress. The, uh, worst happens when the when the virus actually starts killing the uh, the air sac the uh, the cells in the, at the end of these uh, uh, these uh, uh, networks. Those are the cells that are basically involved in extracting oxygen. So that basically uh, hinders the oxygen supply to lung, and this is uh, and that's when uh, you know the patients are hospitalized, and then they are uh, you know on on oxygen supply uh, through when ventilators. So a uh, few more things we have learned that COVID-19 results in exhaustion of T cell lymphocytes. These are immune fighting cells. These are the cells that, uh, you know, actually are deployed to fight with the virus. We also learned that uh, uh, SARS-CoV-2, in fact, uh, it has a high, high, you know, uh, propensity to infect the T cells. Uh, and you can see that the previous SARS virus did not have this ability, uh, which is very concerning because, the, uh, which is very concerning. Uh, uh, so bringing the biology together, what happens? That, so there is a mild infection, which can be cleared out by your immune system. And this happens in 90 or 90 percent cases in in 90 to 94% percent cases, the patients who were diagnosed with COVID-19. But there are very, uh, you know, uh, little chances that patients will develop uh, a severe infection and then elderly and folks who have uh, prior conditions uh, and chronic other chronic uh, diseases are more prone to this. This results in a lung infection and, uh, um, and T cell uh, uh, damage. So, uh, and as well as uh, release of cytokines uh, and, and uh, which is also called cytokine storm to resulting in lymphopenia. And this can also result in organ failure and uh, uh, death in, in certain cases. So vaccine uh, efforts are already ongoing and we have, uh, we have um, uh, uh, it will take 12 to 18 months for vaccines to become available. And uh, our task force is working on uh, repurposing the drugs, but also finding new drugs uh, um, uh, for normal coronavirus. We have also developed uh, antibody against ACTE2 receptor that can be used in, as a diagnostic tool or as well as a therapeutic tool. And we are also working on potential drug to prevent deaths in COVID-19 patients by reducing ARDS. And you will hear from our team uh, uh, later. And therapies in, in, in clinical trial, we have remdesivir, a drug, and uh, uh, and, uh, and the antibody tocilizumab, uh, tos and, uh, and the name is Actamira. These are the three phase three clinical trials. And then we have a, a convalescent plasma that um, is a filtered plasma used by, for uh, uh, COVID-19 patients. And and so Gilead, Gilead drug uh, has a, you know uh, encouraging result. Uh, so 68 patient from the from the compassionate use trial showed promising response, and this is the result from uh, uh, this week. Uh, uh, University of Chicago uh, had a, uh, uh, that is conducting a clinical trial uh, issued a statement, uh, and I read it to you. The best news is that most of our patients have already been diagnosed, which is great. We have only two patients perish uh, out of uh, in 125 patient, patients, so which is a, a, a promising news. And also hydrochloroquine, which was recommended by ACT Task Force in January 2020 as one of the candidate drugs that can be repurposed in COVID-19. And our and others advocacy with uh, uh, of, uh, you know, an advocacy of international experts has finally resulted in the FDA approval of the drug for em emergency use. And this is one of the two drugs ever to be approved for emergency use. And 
NIH has already started clinical trials and um, you know, it will be good to at least test the efficacy of this drug in clinical trial. And finally, uh, uh, you know, convalescent plasma, this is the plasma, filtered plasma from patients who were already um, uh, had COVID-19, uh, you know, is showing uh, efforts in, uh, in certain hospitals now in clinical trial in 100, 100 sites. And uh, there is also need for convalescent plasma. So if you are a COVID-19 patient and you would like to donate, we will welcome your donations. And I will leave you with uh, 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 one of the countries, Taiwan, whose response to this um, uh, uh, crisis has been appreciated worldwide, um, uh, uh, how they have, you know, tested, you know, monitored patients. So I, I would like you to look at into this story. And with that, I give you uh, the amazing 2020 uh, 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 and welcome you all uh, to the panel. So uh, I start with the, uh, with the, our uh, uh, keynote panel. The keynote panel is focused on uh, the topic is precision medicine in cancer and COVID. And we have uh, Dr. Samoharaf Achkar, who is a lung cancer survivor uh, and a family physician at uh, UW Medicine. We have Dr. George Fisher, who is a GI oncologist at a, a professor at Stanford Cancer Institute. We have Dr. Chelsea Boyd, who is colon cancer survivor and physician at Spectrum Health. And uh, we have uh, Dr. Hatel Gore, who is a, a COVID-19 survivor and uh, OBGYN physician at Women's Own OBGYN. And, and, uh, and uh, last but not least, we have Meredith Bernhardt, from, uh, who is a director at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. Uh, and uh, Leukemia and Lymphoma Society is also our advocacy partner in this, um, um, uh, in this uh, uh, Panel. So, I would uh, uh, so I would ask panelists uh, you briefly uh, uh, to introduce yourself. You know, and so what do you do? What is your professional interest? And uh, and how this COVID nineteen pandemic has affected you, uh, your personal and or your professional uh, uh, life. So I'll start with uh, uh, Dr. Achkar. Hi, everyone. My name is Morha Falashkar. I am a faculty here, assistant professor at the University of Washington. I am a family physician and I do research. Uh, I'm also a stage four lung cancer survivor myself. I take treatment uh, daily. I take targeted therapy. Um, the COVID-19 uh, has affected my, me on multiple levels professionally. I've uh, actually stopped seeing patients directly. I've been doing only telemedicine from home. Uh, on a personal level, I've been staying home for the past for over a month uh, with minimum contact with actually close to zero contact besides grocery that gets delivered, delivered to my house. Uh, other level professionally, I've shifted my focus. I've, in, in, I was working on projects on learning about the experiences of people with lung cancer. Uh, I focused with that specifically on how they're doing with the COVID-19 and I disseminated some work about that. We also shifted my research as a qualitative researcher to look at the experiences of different groups, especially marginalized communities, such as people with cancer in healthcare workforce with, uh, with COVID-19. How are they living with it? How are they coping with it? I'm expecting qualitative work to come out. Thank you, Doc, Dr. Achkar. Yeah. Uh, and next, I will uh, request uh, uh, Dr. Fisher, who is uh, who is a, a famous physician. He's also he was also a physician for uh, uh, Patrick Swayze and uh, and as well as uh, Steve Jobs. Dr. Fisher. Yes. Hello. Uh, well, I'm a GI medical oncologist, and my uh, I split my time between taking care of GI malignancies and also doing research, primarily clinical trials. Uh, I'd say COVID has had a huge practice on everyone, of course, and, and in, in cancer, though, pa patients still need treatment. They still need surgeries. They do still need scans and, and endoscopies and procedures. And I'm happy that those are still being available, although no doubt being prioritized to the patients who need them most. It's sort of curious and, and standard practice that we're starting to, to uh, reorder our, our treatments. And I think this is varies nationwide uh, from institution to institution, depending on ICU availability, bed availability, and where that particular institution is in the surge of COVID-19. Uh, right now, we have capacity, so we've resumed uh, elective surgeries for cancer. 
We haven't shut down our clinical trials, but we have prioritized those that are most beneficial to patients. So patients still have access to clinical trials. And, uh, and we're moving forward cautiously, but we're still moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. So uh, Dr. Uh, uh, Boyd, who is also a cancer survivor, uh, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Chelsea Bowett. I am a primary care physician trained in internal medicine and pediatrics. I'm in Grand Rapids, Michigan. I um, have stage four colon cancer uh, diagnosed two years ago. Um, I've been on full fury and Herbitox for the last close to year and a half. Um, and so I, uh, like Dr. Akhtar, has, have been in major lockdown um, because I'm quite immunosuppressed. So haven't left my house really in five weeks other than for chemo. Um, I'm also still working and I'm also 100% seeing um, video visits. So I'm still able to practice the primary care and doing a lot of mood checks. The anxiety is very high right now. Um, ADHD follow-ups, diabetes follow-ups, we're able to keep a lot of people out of our office. Um, and it's really seemed to change the way that we're gonna practice medicine from you know this point forward. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Boyd. And I would like to request Dr. Gore, uh, who is a COVID-19 survivor, to introduce herself. Hi, my name is Dr. Heather Gore. I'm a practicing uh, board certified OBGYN in New Jersey, and I'm a CEO of Health Media LLC and a medical director of Better You Medical Spa. Um, COVID-19, um, when it started, we closed our office. We are doing telemedicine like other physicians, but uh, we're still seeing inpatient uh, who needs uh, the babies to be delivered, as well as in the office, we are seeing pregnant patient and real GYN emergency. So COVID-19 did affect me and I'm gonna tell my stories. So it has affected me as a person, as well as as a physician, how we take care of the patients. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gore. Uh, uh, Meredith, would you like to go ahead and introduce yourself? Great. Hi, I'm Meredith Barnhart. I'm the director of the Information Resource Center at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society. So my staff are actually the individuals that are answering our 800 number. So we're talking to patients and their loved ones about blood cancers, um, treatment options, including clinical trials for treatment, support resources, and financial resources. Um, COVID has certainly had an impact on all patients, all blood cancer patients. Um, and so we've really pivoted to help fill a gap and fill a need um, so that in individuals can get the information that they really need um, from, from us and, and help to be a trusted resource. And, um, you know, I know that the medical team is um, strained right now. And so we're there to help fill in those gaps and to help people really understand what it means to be a blood cancer patient living in this pandemic of COVID-19. Thank you. Thank you, Meredith. So amazing. This is an amazing panel. And uh, 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 I would start by asking, um, uh, it is often said that precision medicine, uh, uh, by integrating social factors, genomics, and medical histories, provides the best picture of patients, uh, allowing for the treatment approaches. So uh, what is the current state of precision medicine, which is, you know, drug diagnostic combination, patient going through that? And what are some of the opportunities for precision medicine based approaches to prevent, diagnose, and treat COVID-19. Anybody would like to take that? I'll, I'll take a jab at it, if you don't mind. I think that, uh, that when we talk about precision medicine specific to COVID-19, I think it's going to be imperative that we collect more data as fast as possible both on, on incidence of active infections and on acquisition of, of serologies that, that indicate some degree of immunity. Uh, I think that uh, the lymphopenias that have been associated with, with COVID-19 are concerning to those people who need lymphocytes in order to respond to, to uh, some of our new immunotherapies, yet we don't know yet how much that's compromised. So as we proceed with business as usual uh, with safe uh, asymptomatic patients, I think we have a lot to learn about uh, what COVID does in short term and long term in terms of chemosensitivity and risks. 
Thank you, Dr. Fisher. Yeah, I think APM uh, Coronavirus Task Force, you will, we will hear more from the data science team and we are uh, trying to take a, you know, a shot at some of those uh, 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 data sets to deliver the promise of precision medicine. Prashun, your mic is muted. Please unmute yourself. Thank you. Uh, yeah, so uh, thank you for those uh, answers. And as there are most, most of the physicians here, I would like to ask, as the medical community is practicing uh, uh, medical distancing with additional protective measures in the clinic uh, through televisits, uh, 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 and the New York Times published an article about uh, uh, difficulties faced even in the clinic when an oncologist is refrained from touching a patient due to uh, medical distancing measures. So how hard is it to uh, adjust to telemedicine and balance not being able to see a patient live, but still provide uh, you know, effective care and maintain the uh, doctor-patient relationship? Uh, Dr. Ashkar, would you like to, uh, uh, you know, comment about your studies from the patient provider perspective to overcome uh, telemedicine barriers? Yeah, yeah. Thank you very much for this. this is a very important question. Um, there had been a learning curve with the telemedicine. Institutions have tried to implement it for a while, but now with the COVID-19, there had been an urgency to do that very fast. So people had to learn and had to adapt. Uh, telemedicine is a perfect fit for many situations. You know, if you're just talking to your patients about uh, um, their diabetes and how they're doing, what they're eating, their exercise, or about their mental health, for example, such as depression or anxiety, and you want to have conversation, counsel, provide support, actually it can be convenient, can be a great choice. It might be difficult for other places, for oncology specifically, for example, I, I imagine as a patient myself, I can speak if uh, I would like my oncologist to talk to me by telemedicine and tell me the reports of the CT scan so without having to drive and park in that location. So there are definitely opportunities in there with telemedicine and uh, the convenience of it, the uh, protections of the patient, especially we're talking about people with multiple chronic conditions with higher risk for, 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 uh, for suffering consequences from the COVID-19. I think protecting them with the telemedicine, in addition to protecting the staff become really paramount at this point. It can be challenging, obviously you're not getting the, uh, you're not doing physical exams. So sometimes, you know, I see patients with respiratory symptoms and will be, I wish I would be able to listen to their lungs and, or people with uh, stomach issues and I can't really touch their stomach. So uh, that is a limitation, but there are ways around it. Obviously people are triaging their patients. So if, to, if a visit that's not appropriate for telemedicine, uh, many clinics have open spaces for people to come in person or to the clinic itself or to go to urgent care. So I think people are working working around it, and there are plenty of opportunities in this area. Thank you. And how about, uh, you know, uh, would anybody would like to discuss the, uh, a shift from more patient-centric care through home health models for you know, infusion therapies uh, uh, amidst COVID-19, you know, pandemic, actually? So the question pertains to the, and, you know, the home health care. So besides telemedicine, you know, home health uh, uh, models. Dr. Boyd, would you like to take that? Sure. Um, so in our hospital system, I am not because I don't leave my home anymore, but in our hospital system, there's um, been a big group of physicians who've been mobilized to do a lot of home medicine. Um, so we're doing now home visits um, for chronically ill patients, for elderly patients who are at a high risk for complications from coronavirus. Um, and with the goal of keeping them safe in their homes, but also having the ability to do those physical exams for things that are not appropriate for um, telemedicine. Um, it's really just getting off the ground now, obviously, because everything, all the adjustments that we're making um, with COVID are just getting off the ground, but it seems to be something that will probably stick around as well. Um, I don't know. I don't. I haven't heard that our infusion center for through the cancer center is doing any home infusions for chemotherapy. Um, I would certainly take them up on that if they were. <laughs> um, but um, so I don't think we're there. We are doing um, mobile blood draws for people who just need their blood draws, and then they they can have their six month or one year follow up with their oncologist. 
um, by a telehealth. Um, they have a mobile blood draw station where people can just drive up and get their blood drawn in their car. Um, and the phlebotomists are in full PPE. Um, protective equipment, you know, masks, head, head coverings, the whole shebang um, to try to keep people socially distanced and safe as well. Thank you. I think, yeah, that's, uh, uh, yeah, I think it's uh, good to see that um, and telemedicine in really, uh, uh, I think I was talking to a, phys a, phys a telemedicine uh, executive in January and adoption was uh, um, uh, almost eight uh, percent, but now it's almost uh, you know over seventy percent uh, due to the due to this uh, um, uh, uh, pandemic actually. So, um, uh, so next I would like to you know bring um, uh, focus to Dr. Gore. Dr. Gore, you have you know uh, uh, can you walk through us uh, through your experience with being infected with COVID nineteen and how did you get through that? Uh, what is uh, you know. Uh, Prodrome and why is it important to know about the early signs of COVID-19? Um, thank you, Ms. Uh, Dr. Mishra. Uh, you know, I've been talking about since February and March about COVID and how, um, you know, it can affect us and the symptoms, etc. But what was missing, uh, we never heard from China or Italy or uh, or Spain about any of the prodrome syndrome. So when I myself started feeling um, like tired and weak and no energy, I just didn't think it was COVID because nobody was talking about it at that point. Everybody was talking about fever and cough and shortness of breath. Um, so I had two, three days of um, severe weakness as if I had ran like a few marathons and no energy. I thought maybe I'm coming down with flu. After um, two or three days of that, I started developing GI symptoms, uh, feeling very nauseous, had some diarrhea. So I thought maybe it's a stomach bug, right? Um, and then I lost taste. I had no taste in my food. I lost a, a sense of smell, which was really um, very distinct. Like if you get it, like the, no food, there was no taste, be it a sweet, spicy, sour. And um, that was a little bit um, confusing. So those symptoms lasted anywhere from five to six days before I had a fever. And once I got fever and cough and um, shortness of breath, that's when I realized maybe this is COVID. And, um, and of course, I had the whole gamut. My pulse ox showed that I had um, 92 pulse ox. My pulse was 140. My temperature was 102. That's when, because I had access to all that, because in my spa, we do um, day surgeries. So I had access to all those monitors. So that's why I got lucky and I could monitor myself at home and I started the medication. But when I'm talking with everybody, I'm trying to make sure people do understand to look out for those symptoms, because as soon as you get those prodrome, it's very important to isolate yourself, A, to, to restrict the transmission to loved ones and to general public. Uh, thank you, Dr. Gore. And you know, as you know, that there is a a, a lot of uh, 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 you know scare um, and folks uh, who have uh, uh, you know cancer and other uh, chronic diseases are really uh, concerned. And overall, public is very concerned to return to work. You know, so what can you tell those uh, those patients and their families? So um, I think it's still very imperative um, as and when the governors and, and the president decides to kind of cut down the lockdown and how we are going to again uh, go back to work and assimilate with the general um, you know, population is still, uh, you know, they are making the guidelines. But I think the, what we know right now it's not just it's a droplet uh, transmission, but of course it's an aerosol transmission. So if we have to go back to work, I think it will be very important to keep still physical distancing, keep you know as much distance as possible. I would really suggest to wear some sort of a mask, either surgical mask or home in bandana, because as you can see, the amount of virus transmission either from you to the others or you getting it is going to be reduced dramatically uh, with some sort of a, a mask. So that's going to be a key. Um, wearing gloves if you are touching uh, common surfaces and trying to dis, um, you know, dispose those gloves in a, in, a, 
in a good fashion without infecting others and not kind of causing cross-contamination by touching multiple surfaces. Um, so that's going to be another um, important point. And hand washing and other things that we are saying. But if you had um, symptoms yourself, CDC has a very specific the guidelines, you have to be 72 hours without fever, cough, shortness of breath, or 10 days from the beginning of your symptoms to go back to your work. So I think we are still following those guidelines. And when you go back to work for at least two more weeks, you should be wearing all the protective gears. So right now I'm at the hospital. When I'm seeing the patient, I'm still wearing the mask the gloves, the head covers, uh, et cetera, not just to prevent infection to me, but from me going to the other people. So that's kind of CDC guidelines that one has to follow. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gore, for that and those advice. And I'm sure, you know, those are, you know, all uh, very uh, uh, good points, uh, uh, the transmission from, uh, you know, just overall community, but also healthcare workers who are working with the patients, you know, how they take care that the disease doesn't uh, spread. So it's medical distancing. So uh, uh, the other question that I have is the, so uh, Dr. Boyd, last week, uh, it was uh, elders, adolescent and young adults um, um, uh, with uh, Cancer Awareness Week, and we had a, you know, a great webinar. And so, um, uh, how, you know, how you, have you seen young adults and children being affected by COVID-19 and what strategies can be employed to best uh, protect their health without affecting their development? So thankfully, in terms of the disease itself, um, children seem to be mildly affected. Um, it's rare that they're hospitalized. It's exceedingly rare that they have serious complications where they're ending up on ventilators. We've had, I believe, two or three deaths in the country. Um, so we're not quite sure why children um, are faring so much better, but it's definitely a pattern that we're seeing. Um, all the while, kids are all out of school, at least in Michigan, we're done with school for the year. Um, so we have this gap in education and this gap in the social emotional um, connection that these kids are, are able to make with other children for the next four months until the school year starts back up. Um, and I think that's the biggest challenge with COVID right now for children and adolescents is the um, social impact um, I think our teachers will really have a um, interesting uh, hurdle come August when schools restart to catch the kids back up um, from the remote learning that they've been doing and from the um, learning that they missed out on the previous school year. I have full confidence that they'll be able to do it. Um, I think it'll just be a really unique situation. Um, and developmentally, you know, kids are so resilient. I think they'll do fine. I don't anticipate, you know, long-term effects in ter from children having this gap in their education it's a couple months. Um, the, the worry being the kids who are not safer at home, the kids who are living in, um, in abusive environments and in um, places in neighborhoods where they're not safe. So that's really the the definite. Um, um, that's the, the those are the outliers that I do worry about, and I don't have a good answer um, for what, what what we'll see. Um, but I know as as pediatricians and family physicians, we are certainly aware of those risks to kids, and really have our radars up um, to um, to be on the lookout for kids that are in those extenuating circumstances. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Boyd. Yeah, I think Panelists, so. just a reminder and Prashun, there's two minutes remaining. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, so, uh, cancer so Dr. Fisher, cancer patients are, you know, scared to come to um, their clinic and hospital appointments due to risk of being in, uh, inf uh, infected from COVID-19 impacting their uh, cancer care and participation in clinical trials. What are the strategies uh, have uh, uh, you brainstormed with your institution and at the national level, uh, including NCI and your association with NCI to assist these patients in this situation? 
Yeah, well, I guess a, if there's a silver lining to this, and it's already been alluded to earlier, is the, the implementation, rapid implementation and acceptance of telehealth. So I think that's going to be a net positive eventually for healthcare, assuming that payers will reimburse it after the fact. I think that there's also a, a clear prioritization of, of cancer treatments and surveillance that we've taken on to try to minimize the number of trips that patients have to make to and from uh, hospitals. Uh, if it help, allows us to, to actually implement what we've always wanted to do is home treatments, uh, that would be wonderful. And I think that there's, there are studies actually ongoing for that. Nationally, I think it really depends on your area. I mean, the, the, the trouble with uh, you know, the, the onslaught of the New York hospitals, they don't have ICU beds. And so they have to be careful with any surgery that what might occupy an ICU bed or, or any prolonged hospitalization with the number of patients that they have there. So in general, we're trying to, to minimize hospitalizations for patients. We're trying to minimize trips to the cancer center. There is evidence that cancer patients, of course, are, are more susceptible to getting the virus and, and certain subsets of cancer patients, whether they're immunosuppressed or have uh, lung uh, problems, may be more susceptible to serious consequences and, of, uh, of the virus. And so lots of concerns all throughout. We're, we're putting in precautions while we, where, wherever we can while still trying to give people appropriate treatments. And, uh, and uh, cancer patients are often have weakened immune systems, uh, you know, or maybe taking chemo radiation therapy that might impact their immune system. And uh, some of the treatment proposed for COVID-19, you know, such as IL-6 uh, blockers are looking to shutting down their immune system. So what is the thinking behind this and how tricky it might uh, be the strategy, you know, for the, uh, to, for the cancer care, Dr. Fisher, any thoughts on that? I'd say tricky is, Pretty close to the right word, <laughs> because we're we're still dealing with a dearth of data, and so I think we have to generate that data. Uh, institutions are participating in, in group projects to try to under, identify what the uh, what the prevalence of COVID positive cancer patients are, and how that changes with waves as the, as the virus goes through, and then how we accommodate that. Now, so far, if somebody is is uh, infected with COVID nineteen and has otherwise adequate counts, is minimally symptomatic. We're still proceeding with treatments, but it is with some caution. And that's, of course, has to be uh, weighed with the importance of the treatment. So some adjuvant treatments, some post-operative treatments that are sort of insurance policies are understandably being delayed. Whereas uh, patients with active disease, stage four disease, we're, we're continuing to treat because that's the bigger fear for the patients. And, and we're trying to tr use less myelosuppressive treatments whenever we can. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Fisher. And, um, uh, uh, so, Meredith, you know, how Leukemia Lymphoma uh, Society is championing the advocacy by bringing the patients and caregiver community together uh, with healthcare providers in these uh, distant times, and how can these lessons be applied to patients uh, with other types of cancers? Great. Thank you. This is a wonderful question. And, um, you know, for those that are on, you know, having a cancer is a difficult time. Um, but then living in the world of COVID-19, being a cancer patient, it brings up a lot of additional fear and anxiety um, and uncertainty. It really exacerbates that. And so I think a lot of the advocacy organizations, including the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, have really pivoted, not just now to provide information about the cancers and provide information support resources about the cancers, but also to really expand on the impact that the COVID has um, on individuals who are in treatment for cancer. Um, so for at the Leukemia and Lymphoma Society, we're providing information on COVID and how they, that impacts blood cancer patients. Um, we've also opened up financial resources for individuals. We know that that's really a stressor at this time. Um, and then we've also expanded our online services. Um, so we have online chats, we have, um, we've expanded our telephone matching program, our Patty Robinson First Connection program. Um, and we've worked with our nutritionists so that we can help with individuals who are having difficulty obtaining food um, and have that food insecurity. Um, so we really tried to pivot to meet families where they are and to provide the resources that are so up to date for them. And we know that this will continue and I know that the other advocacy organizations will continue to work with um, because this is a new norm that we have now. Um, we don't know what the lasting effects of COVID-19 are and, and where we'll be um, 
post COVID-19 um, or in that kind of later stages of COVID-19. So we certainly want to be there. Um, and I know that all the other like uh, other, other cancer organizations um, are, are doing the same of being there and being a trusted resources for patients and caregivers. They are not alone in this um, and we want them to be able to reach out. And there is information on the GRIT website um, for organizations that can be a source of support during this difficult time. Thank you, Mary. And in conclusion, you know, how we all learn from uh, this pandemic and how this will help us in the uh, future uh, to expedite scientific discoveries, publications, you know, diagnostics, uh, uh, you know, uh, healthcare access, treatment paradigms, uh, accelerated approvals, you know, any concluding thoughts on this from panelists? I just hope I can shake hands and hug my patients again sometime soon. If there are no further comments, thank you. Thank you very much. I, I you know, I thank you all the panelists and uh, and uh, thank you for all all your you know sharing your experiences, your uh, uh, your uh, uh, guidance with the patients. And with that, we uh, uh, continue to the next panel. Thank you all. Hello, everyone. This is Lonnie Bookbinder. I'm the moderator for the next panel. I'm just checking, can, can you all hear me okay? Thank you. Um, I can't tell if my picture's on the screen or not, but uh, I'm the uh, CEO of Arise Precision Medicine. Uh, we're a cancer drug development company, and uh, personally I've had uh, multiple cancers myself. Um, I'm a survivor and uh, have 50 years of uh, drug development in the cancer field. I'd like to share with you a little focus on hope today. Um, I've uh, seen the rise and fall of uh, chemotherapy and monoclonal antibody therapy, and now into the precision medicine type drugs. And I think there's even more to come. We're gonna be able to cure cancer in the next uh, decade and uh, great hope for everybody who's uh, in the field, as well as those who might be exposed or uh, uh, currently have cancer and look to the future with hope. Um, so a couple things that are hot off the press right now, um, the FDA has been very active in increasing the, the number of drugs available, plasmapheresis and plasma therapy being some of the new things. Um, it was great that Pursum went over a lot of the uh, other drugs like remdesivir and uh, the, old, the, the process of repurposing uh, drugs. Uh, bringing new immune drugs into play. Um, <clears throat> we're going to have a, a panel here that goes from bench to bedside. And in a moment, we'll introduce our panelists. But I'd like to just give my comment about precision medicine because my company's name is Arise Precision Medicine. And to me, it means getting the right drug to the right place at the right time, at the right dose, and not harming normal cells. That's the overall goal of my company and I think of many of the people involved in precision medicine. And now to start the panel, bench to bedside, I'd like to introduce our panelists and have them um, give a brief uh, um, introduction on themselves. So we'll start with Dr. Deepak Asudani. Um, Deepak, can you say hello and uh, just give a brief back background? Good morning, good afternoon. Um, I know uh, a lot of you are on the East Coast, so, well, that's where I trained too, so. Um, um, right now, I'm working as a clinician uh, by trade at UC San Diego in San Diego, and uh, I've been actively engaged uh, in the disaster management here when uh, COVID um, became first introduced uh, to this area. And uh, I also work as a medical director for International Patients Program, and uh, we'll, we'll be chatting a lot more about the therapeutics that we have and uh, potential promises. I think um, we have learned a lot about COVID on the go and we were not really prepared, but I think we have certain advantages now, a certain edge that we have that makes us so much more, uh, so much more capable to handle this. Thank you, Deepak. And uh, we have really benefited by your uh, contributions to our group and 
uh, your understanding and sharing, and I think we've all been enriched by your knowledge that you've created. Next up, we'd like to uh, have Dr. Rupesh Chattaburti uh, give us uh, his background a little bit. Hey, um, good afternoon and good morning. Um, I'm Rupesh and uh, I'm a professor in uh, India in a uh, university, Jawaharlal Nehru University. By training, I'm an immunologist and I specifically look at how innate immune response uh, uh, you know, it's a dynamic during, it's dynamics during uh, uh, infection. And my research is mostly focused on how these pathogen interacts with uh, immune cells as well as epithelial cells and how their interaction between immune cells and epithelial cells during uh, infection decide or determines how the disease is going to uh, progress. We have seen a lot of data coming from, uh, uh, you know, uh, bit and pieces. We were trying to put them together so that we can see how exactly we can, uh, you know, benefit and provide uh, more information so that the clinicians can really make a decisions. Thank you, Rupesh. And uh, as an immunologist, uh, you represent part of the bench level scientists that uh, we're uh, going to be uh, talking to here today. Um, and I've learned so much from immun immunologists over the year. It's really quite an intricate uh, science. Uh, and I thank you for your contributions. Um, normally, I would be introducing Dr. Jacob Glanville at this point in time from Distributed Bio, but uh, he unfortunately has a family emergency. And so uh, he's not here today, but uh, he's got a great uh, company going, uh, some good activity in, in, in the sense of new uh, therapies. Um, and we, we will miss him and uh, please uh, keep his and him and his family in your prayers. Uh, right now, we're gonna talk uh, briefly with uh, Dr. Cindy Ho. Um, she'll tell you that she's a uh, infection control officer and give you some more detail about her experience. Hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you are. I just wanted to say hello and uh, tell you a little bit about my connection to cancer. My niece unfortunately had a glioblastoma multiforme uh, when uh, she was um, very young and she passed away. And um, so that's my connection to cancer. Um, as far as myself, I am an infectious disease doctor and I serve the community in South Jersey. We are a system of three hospitals. It's called Jefferson Health, New Jersey. And as an infectious disease doctor, my role is to prevent infection and then to treat. And then on, a, um, on, on what I do in the hospital has been to see kind of all, nearly all of the COVID patients. And so you can imagine it's, it's very intense and just different levels of interactions than ever before. These days, it's not uncommon for doctors to do uh, telephone consults or televideo consults, but I just kind of go old school and just put on all the PPE and just go in there and see the patients come out, interact with the nursing staff and other people and just kind of um, see these individuals, whether they're in the ICU or if they're on the floors. So I'll turn it back to you, uh, Dr. Bookbinder. Thank you, Cindy. And uh, <clears throat> she's gonna be answering some of the questions that we would have asked uh, Jacob to answer. And so uh, she's gonna do double duty today. Uh, Cindy, uh, I share with you um, the concern about family members. I have a grandson who is a survivor of a very rare form of lymphoma. And uh, I was up in Seattle at the time, and we got such great help from the Seattle physicians. And he was kind of a breakthrough, saved child. Uh, and now he's uh, in college and uh, studying aeronautics. So uh, we're, we're all so pleased with the outcome there. Um, I'm also pleased to introduce Dr. William Howell. Uh, uh, Bill is a uh, pathologist, and when you think about precision medicine, I, I can't imagine anybody more valuable to a precision medicine team than a pathologist who understands so much about the background and the, and the uh, various aspects of therapy from uh, diagnosis and therapy from the initial uh, insult. And so, uh, uh, Bill, we're going to uh, give you a chance to introduce yourself, and then I'm going to have you answer the first question in our, on our panel uh, in the area of pathology diagnosis and treatment op options, if you can just go right on through and talk about how this virus is attacking humus, humans and 
little background information that way. Okay, thank you very much, Lonnie. Appreciate the introduction, and I apologize for the dark background. So my name is uh, Bill Howell, and as Lonnie mentioned, I am a physician scientist. Um, I originally did my graduate work um, in mouse molecular genetics uh, prior to medical school, in which case I ultimately ended up in, in pathology and have largely been working um, in CROs in the Bay Area uh, since that time. So uh, let's now move into some of the uh, basic biology of uh, COVID-19. And I'm going to attempt to share my screen. Never done this before, so we'll see whether it works. There we go. Appreciate your patience. Okay. Is that working? Yes, it is. Good. Okay. We don't see it in our end. Oh, this is starting up now. Okay, good. You're good. Okay. So the basic uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, life cycle is that uh, the virus particles um, the, specifically the S protein spike um, on the exterior of the particles uh, docks with the host um, angiotensin converting enzyme to receptor. Subsequently, a, ser a transmembrane serine protease, Tempris 2, um, cleaves part of that uh, S protein that then facilitates a membrane fusion with the cell. Um, upon entry into the cell, uh, the cellular ribosomes translate um, a poly pro polyprotein um, of, the poly of the positive stranded RNA, and that, that is subsequently uh, proteolytically uh, processed. Next, uh, full length copies of both strands of the RNA are made, and the final um, portion is the translation of the a remainder of the actual structural components of the virus particle. The virus particles are uh, assembled and then subsequently released from the cell. One of the interesting aspects of this whole process is that many of the different points um, of this um, viral life cycle actually are potentially uh, targetable. Um, and some of them actually have been uh, targeted, at least in small studies, uh, somewhat successfully. And we can go more into that later on. Thank you, Bill. And we'll, uh, we'll, we'll come back and get more of your wisdom in a few moments. Uh, now I'd like to uh, ask uh, Rupesh, if he would just give us a little bit of an idea of how the immune system responds at the start of therapy and if time allows, a little bit about what happens during hospitalization and towards the end of therapy to some of the patients who are unfortunately um, going to be staying for a while or, or maybe not even coming off of the respirators. So can, yeah. yes, can you hear? Yes. So, Lenny, as uh, you know, in our um, you know uh, opening ceremony, um, Dr. Mishra talked about that with the infection of uh, this novel uh, coronavirus two. Eighty percent people they are asymptomatic or they don't require a hospitalization. Approximately in the U.S., ninety percent, nineteen percent of the infected patients they need uh, some sort of hospitalization, and of those. 26 to 32 percent, they are really uh, going to the ICU. If you look at among the patients which are getting hospitalized, 20 to 40 percent of patients, they do develop uh, acute respiratory uh, disorder syndrome. 
which involves, as uh, previously um, a lot of his speaker has told, that it involves the branchular or the lung of a, a, a patient. But if you look at the ICU patient, around 67 to 85% patients go into, uh, uh, you know, they go into the arts. So if you look at the immune response dynamics, how it basically progresses with the disease, that's, that's, a very, that's a very important and pertinent for the management as well as for the diagnosis of, uh, of patients and for the also to find out what medicine is going to uh, uh, work. So initially, uh, there is a word, there is not a lot of data is, uh, is available there, but there is a, some data available, which shows that with the infection uh, in a patients which are getting admitted to the hospital, there is an increase into the uh, some cytokines, and they are basically mostly they were driven by IL six, TGF um, not TGF beta but IL IL one beta. But as the disease progresses, what happens? There is an increase into other cytokines and patients get overwhelmed with that uh, uh, cytokine and we call it cytokine star. And it not only have a uh, IL-6, but there is a reports which are showing that there's increase into the IL-1 beta and IL-2, IL-2 receptors, and all they are the cocktail for activation of uh, uh, immune response. So there is a kind of a, like a cycle starts within the uh, innate immune response, which is majority, which is, uh, which is a primary responders of a, a host or the body against any type of uh, uh, infection. So you will see that what happens as the disease progress, these inflammatory response goes really, really over jealous. So it seems like, you know, in an immune response, there is a two type of a response. One is innate immune response, another is T cells are, we call it cellular or adaptive immune response, which is a more precise immune response. Whereas uh, innate immune response is like more in the off the cuff kind of a, a response our body uh, gives. So, so in these uh, uh, infection or in the COVID-19 patients, what is happening, T cells are going down. So helper cells as well as suppressor cells are going down. As disease progresses, you know, studies are showing that there is a increase into the neutrophil versus lymphocyte uh, ratios. So it seems like there is a not only decrease into the lymphocyte or lympho, there is a lympho, uh, lymphopenia, but also there is a decrease into the helper cells as well as the uh, uh, suppressor cells. Thank you very much, Rupesh. That was a good explanation. It's a very complex matter and it's one that at the bench there is a lot of work going on now to understand not only what is happening, but where are the intervention points because you have an active infection and uh, then you also have an over uh, immune uh, response and uh, they're out of sync together. Um, and so for right now, uh, we've been talking about the bench. Now we're gonna go to the bedside and uh, have Dr. Asudani give us an idea about what's the current standard of care and um, how is that going uh, overall? Thank you, Lani. So uh, <clears throat> standard of care, I wish there were to be a standard of care because this, this is so new. We are learning a lot about it, but I think I think a lot of things we have simplified. We have been able to kind of identify mild cases versus moderate and severe, requiring uh, ventilator support and so forth. When when I talk about standard of care, maybe I'll begin with uh, saying that our first effort is to uh, to try to minimize its spread. And you hear about social distancing, about flattening the curve, and that's a community standard of care. And, and that, is, that is really very important, wearing the masks and, and having the right kind of gear to kind of delay it uh, from be becoming overwhelming. Having said that, if you, have, if you do have a patient who, who is admitted or who, who does uh, get infected by, uh, with COVID, then as clinicians, we like to think about mild cases, uh, which fortunately are predominant and including asymptomatic cases. So those are predominant cases. And uh, essentially what they require is for, uh, uh, for constant monitoring of symptoms that there's no deterioration and making sure that uh, the immune system is not overwhelmed. I wouldn't, I wouldn't go into a lot of details from the immune response because we just talked about that. And um, when it gets to a point where uh, 
the immune system is acting up too much, that's when we start worrying about um, kind of how do we try to minimize or mitigate those and those aspects. There are several uh, modalities. I think I think the single most um, a single most um, utility is oxygen supplementation, trying to make sure that uh, hypoxia or low oxygen state is kind of not taking over because then you run into a lot of, lot of issues, kind of uh, respiratory decompensation, uh, kind of secondary sepsis. And uh, that, that kind of is where uh, the branch off point. And we do have certain therapeutics. I'm sure we're going to talk more about individual and you know, about various options that we have. So, so the standard of care is minimizing its progression and um, making sure that you know, we identify it early on and be vigilant about its progression you know, when, when they require nasal cannula, when they need to, uh, uh, to advance to ventilator support and whatnot. Thank you very much. And uh, we, we welcome your comments uh, over the past month or so because you've, you've taught us a lot about where we stand and, and what work we have to do. Um, today, uh, we've talked about uh, the bench. Uh, we've talked a little bit about the current uh, 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 t care. Uh, and we have to talk now a little bit about, well, what can we do to prevent COVID-19? And so, Dr. Ho, if you would uh, uh, come back on again, I'd like to give you the opportunity to talk about uh, uh, vaccines. And uh, of course, the first, the first question that I have is, um, will, will a vaccine give us herd immunity? Will it really protect us? Yeah, so there's a lot of hope in vaccines. I think the truth is it, it, there's a wide range of estimates of how long it'll take, but the, I think the very exciting thing about this particular time with COVID-19 is how there is so much uh, collaboration and that the general timelines of how long things would take, they're being much more expedited. Having said that, I think, you know, I, I'm, the answer is I'm not sure if we're gonna get uh, as much herd immunity as you would like with most other vaccines because I don't know how long exactly uh, the better ones will take. We, um, there are different estimates and some are in um, kind of a, a faster mode than others. Um, and also it's a question of what will the uptake be as far as will you actually have 100% of people who qualify actually take them? And the answer is I, I think we won't in a similar way that some people choose not to have kind of the regular known vaccines that we have. So, um, so I, you know, I, of course I would hope so, but I, I, I'm not sure at the moment if we will, we will absolutely get herd immunity from vaccines. Thank you for that uh, set of comments. Um, I Early in my career, I worked for a company called Letterly, and we had an influenza vaccine. And uh, we learned that it, it was not um, as effective as we hoped. And uh, we still face that same kind of challenge today. Um, so my next question is, um, Dr. Ho, if, if you could describe any of the leading vaccines or um, a new antibody therapeutic uh, uh, candidates uh, and, and what their benefits might be to us. Yeah, so there, there's different strategies for vaccines and um, the doctor that had the emergency, I, I just kind of quickly reviewed his company and it's basically pretty amazing. But since January, they've been working on strategies to um, basically look for monoclonal antibodies as a, as a mechanism to essentially um, target the COVID-19. And they, even though the area they're from was in San Francisco where there's already a lockdown, basically um, they were working and volunteering to go in and kind of risk their lives with the lockdown and everything. And so uh, those I have not heard as much about as far as how far along they are. I think um, many of us have heard about the vaccine candidates with certain companies that have, co one company in particular that has collaborated the NIH, which has a lot of buzz and interest. Um, and uh, there's a lot of hope for that particular one because the 
escalation as far as production will be very quick. Um, and I think the other thing that's um, very fascinating these days is that uh, academic institutions are partnering with, with uh, commercial companies. And, and I think what's very different now is that, uh, you know, generally would want to wait for a vaccine to prove that it's efficacious, but there are some institutions that are even finding manufacturing uh, sites to collaborate to basically up the ante as, as soon as possible. And I, and I think all of this is just, again, now in this timeline of with COVID-19, how everything, the timeline is being smushed all together in a good way. Um, and, and, and it's, it's, you know, a call to arms for, for many different areas of, uh, in the pr production of vaccines and so forth. So I won't comment about the specific names, but just know that there are many people racing all over the world to um, try to vaccines. And I think in the end, we'll probably have more than one. Uh, we, we probably will have more than one and uh, tracking some of the vaccines and clinical trials. So right now there's over 50 trials going on uh, with vaccines and um, antiviral drugs uh, and antibody uh, and a variety of other types of therapies. There's a lot of promise for the future here. Um, one of the challenges uh, that um, occurred in my career was I did have vaccines. I also had monoclonal antibodies. And we were always wondering about uh, whether the patients would recover uh, uh, from uh, any kind of infection or if they would have a durable immunity when we were talking about vaccines. And I wonder if you could just chat about that for a second. Yeah, I mean, I think part, part of it is the unknown. I mean, um, it, it, are we going to see kind of different issues just like we do with the flu vaccine where there's a new one that's produced each year? And I, I think a lot of that is unknown, uh, you know, whether this is a one and done or whether um, as, uh, as there's potential developments, whether uh, we'll need to have a, a new rendition of a vaccine. So. For the Thank panel, you. Five minute warning for you guys. Okay, so we're going to move on to another topic, which to me is um, really important about uh, what we're trying to do at uh, AAPM. Uh, we're working on repurposing a drug, and many people are working on repurposing uh, uh, antivirals and immune modulators and new drug approaches. So I'd like to. Um, uh, ask uh, uh, Cindy again if she would just comment about <clears throat> the, the convalescent uh, plasma antibodies and some of the hyperimmune uh, immunoglobulin therapy as one of the ways in which we can treat uh, the, the problems that we're facing right now. Yeah, I think, you know, the convalescent plasma is like super exciting, right? Because um, while we know that people sometimes don't make it, there are plenty of survivors. And, and just imagine if we have an army of survivors potentially being donors of plasma. And one of the things of why it's so exciting is that um, there's maybe not as much that we know about as far as effective treatment, but the concept behind plasma sort of makes sense that somebody's recovered and do they have antibodies? You just infuse that in somebody who who has COVID-19 and you want to see if they overcome treat, uh, overcome their illness. And the, uh, the hypergammaglobulin is essentially a product made from um, a survivor to basically manufacture it versus the plasma would be from individual survivors. So there's a lot of promise in this and certainly there are trials um, and, and uh, many, many institutions are working on this. So I think it's, it's a lot of promise that, we, that, that it could work. Thank you. We've got the five minute countdown uh, already on our screen, um, but I want to make sure that we cover uh, one of my favorite topics these days, ARDS. And so uh, we're going to uh, have to confine ourselves to just very brief comments, but uh, Bill, would you talk a little bit about the scientific rationale to target ARDS um, and uh, what, what you know right now about where we are with that kind of ARDS therapy? Um, well, Unfortunately, unfortunately, with 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 ARDS, there's uh, very little uh, that has actually worked uh, thus far, um, and primarily the 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 primary thoughts at this point are to target the immune system, uh, specifically looking at some of the key uh, modulators of the immune response that uh, seem to have have gone awry, and as Dr. As, as Rupesh uh, pointed out, 
IL-6 um, is certainly one of those, and there are some um, very small trials in China that actually have indicated that that uh, that an anti-IL-6 antibody um, is efficacious. Also, it's come to uh, realization that um, part of the immune response that um, is so um, overblown in um, in ARDS um, and COVID-19 is a Th1 response, and part of that involves IL-17 as essentially one of the master regulators. Um, so likely something along those lines uh, will be important. Um, in addition, there may be ways in which we can uh, dampen um, the actual um, receptor um, binding of the of, of the COVID-19, and that's something that is kind of outside of the uh, actual um, ARDS, but perhaps we can actually find a drug that, that can actually perform both functions. Thank you, Bill. Um, I, I want to just share that uh, our committee uh, at AAPM Therapeutics Committee has already identified uh, target product profiles for ARDS, and uh, we, we see many opportunities to move into another phase of targeted delivery by using inhalation therapy of some of the drugs that are currently being used orally that do cause toxicity. Um, so there's a lot of hope and we're progressing very nicely on developing some of our uh, target candidates uh, at AAPM. Um, we're gonna uh, finish up with the comments from Rupesh and Dr. Astudani. Um, uh, and it's gonna be about, uh, uh, do we know enough about how to attack ARDS? Um, and then uh, Dr. Ashadani, if you'll come on next, uh, just comment a little bit about what your experience is or what you've observed with some of the drugs that are being used that might in, in impact um, ARDS. So Rupesh, you're first. Rupesh, you're muted. So, uh, Lonnie, when it comes to, you know, um, uh, about the odds, I think that the disease is a very heterogeneous in itself. You know, there's a three measure type of, uh, uh, um, the, you know, manifestation has been shown. One is like a hyperimmune response, coagulopathies, and then there is some problem with the endothelial uh, uh, pathology also, and they also involve some lung injuries. So I think the, the the crux of this thing is going to be how we are going to do the stratification of this very heterogeneous uh, uh, disease. And uh, because, you know, that's going to decide whom we were going to treat with the what drug. Because, you know, it could be possible that the one set of patients are going to benefit from one, one drug, but they are not going to benefit from other drug. That drug might uh, even give, uh, could provide us some kind of a harm to them. So I think, you know, the, the, the right now what is, is needed is a discriminator where we can discriminate these patients in terms of a, what is they're going to be, how they are going to progress. And I think that data we are going to get from, you know, using a multi-omics technology where we can go to look at the single cell and specifically looking into the lymph node because that's the part where the where early, you know, the earliest events can happen just after infection, which is happening into the your lung. So I think that's 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 the where we are uh, we are right now, and we definitely need to leverage uh, this multi-omics capability and how we can integrate, especially looking at the single cell and that 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 the decision maker kind of a thing we need in this whole process. And Thank you to uh, attack the odds. Yeah. Thank you. We're going to finish up with uh, some comments from Dr. Astrodani, and then we're going to have, a, 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 I believe we may have questions from the audience, or we're going to take a break. Uh, we'll find out after he speaks about his, uh, his observations about ARDS therapy. Thanks, Lonnie. So, uh, so, so indeed, uh, ARDS, this is not run-of-the-mill typical ARDS that we see in other respiratory failures. Uh, that you go to ARSNET trial, have the uh, low volume of uh, uh, ventilation. I think, I think it is important that we discriminate what kind of ARS it is. Like Rupesh was mentioning, if it's a cytokine storm or 
even even some populations have seen HLH, histiophagocytic lymphocytosis. I will spare the details in the interest of time. Uh, again, what it, what it comes down to is when you actually look under the microscope, what kind of immune response are we seeing? And if you know that information, that's valuable. How do we get that real time? Because every patient behaves differently. That is the trick. So we'll probably have to have a broad spectrum approach towards ours. Try to use a combination where you could use agents like remdesivir. You, you, you may have to use like Janus kinase inhibitors. So we are not mature enough to understand those details. But and the key component is what is leading to this manifestation of ARDS or cytokine storm or HLH. So that is where we lack. But so far, we've had some success with remdesivir. Even um, hydro hydrochloroquine is supposed to have some ARDS properties. Uh, debatable, but at the same time, there is a plethora of drugs which, which like you mentioned, uh, need a closer look under the microscope, which we can use. But so far, what Remdesivir has shown is a promise, uh, that some other agents have shown is a promise. So moving forward, it's going to be, uh, to be very valuable.